Hello, Mind Sitters, Great 11. It is your time now for mathematics, and we're doing functions. I'm not alone. I'm joined now by Natasha. How are you? I'm very well, and happy birthday to you. <laughs> thank you. I was going to sing, but we might just lose all our viewers. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> but I think we look alike, and we, <laughs> we look, look like alike. we're in the same <laughs> age, kind of. Yeah, Don't you, you know think? what I was saying? He can stay. He <laughs> thinks I'm 20 years old, so he can stay. <laughs> and you think I'm 16, right? Yes. And I'm only 14, <laughs> but it's all good. Guess what, my sisters, this is another great show that is sponsored by Macmillan. So big ups to Macmillan and thank you very much. Natasha, on functions today, what's, are you ready for this show? Yes, I'm ready, guys. It's uh, first lesson back. I mean, I know all of you are still at home on holiday going back tomorrow, but it's good to get your brains working today. So uh, we're going to do a little bit of revision, but a lot of intense work on functions. So make sure that your brains have been switched on. I like mm -hmm. that. Make sure your brains are being switched on. Having said that, Natasha, go take your place. Thank you. And we're going to switch on our brains. Mindset is, let's switch on our brains and get on the social networking with me. Of course, on the page, Let's Chat, we are on facebook.com forward slash Len Extra. On Twitter, follow us, Tim Follow Back, and we'll tweet you at Len Extra. You can also download your notes for free on the website, which is lenextra.co.za forward slash live. And I'll be with you chatting, getting all your comments and your pages. And once more again, big ups to Macmillan. Natasha, take it away. All right, guys. So as I said, first lesson for the new term. I hope you're all really excited and you ready to work, even though you only go back to school tomorrow. I mean, you might as well get those brains uh, working now. So as I said in the beginning, we're going to go over functions. We're going to do a little bit of revision, but uh, introduce you to some new concepts as well. So make sure that you are paying attention. And obviously, if you don't understand, as Abraham said, uh, get busy with him on Facebook page and let us know what's going on. Okay, so let's get to it. In this lesson, we're going to look at re the revision of grade 10 functions, which you did last year. And we're also going to look at the effects of A, Q, and P on this. Some of you guys might not recognize yet, but this is your parabola that you learned last year. The defining equation was slightly different, but we'll go over that in a little bit. Uh, we're also going to have a look at the effects of A, Q, and P on, and there's some stuff missing and weird things going on here. This is supposed to be the function of a hyperbola, which looks like this, a over x plus p plus q. All right, and that, again, looks different from the function um, defining equation that you learned last year. That's your hyperbola. And then this is your exponential graph. Guys, we will only look at that next week. Okay, as I said, function has a whole lot of work that we need to do with functions, so we're only going to look at that next week. All right, so let's get started. Let's get started. Okay, we've got quite a lot to cover. So the key concept, you need to remember that for all functions, we will look at the following concepts being true. Okay, now this, remember, this is revision from last year. The addition of Q will translate, translate means move the graph vertically, vertically that way, okay? It will move the graph vertically by Q units with no change in the shape of the graph. So the shape of the graph will stay exactly the same and the graph will just move, translate vertically, so that's up and down the Y axis, all right? We're going to look at the first example just to remind you what we were, what you did last year. And remember the defining equation you learned for a parabola last year was y equals ax squared plus q. Okay, so that's the one we're just going to look at for now. Just revision on that function, okay? Now, if this q is greater than naught, remember greater than naught means positive. So if Q is greater than naught, the graph moves up by Q units. Okay, so if Q is positive, your graph is going to move up by Q units. So if we have a look at an example, if Y is equal to X squared, which is your graph that just turns on the X axis at the point naught, naught. All right, and I'm trying to see if I can get a little bit of movement on this graph. There we go. Okay, not doing what I wanted to, but let's 
let's just fill it in anyway. So if we're looking at the graph y is equal to x squared, which is the one in blue, it turns at the point naught naught. Remember last year, all of your graphs turned on the y-intercepts, which was somewhere on the y-axis. And if we look at the graph, y is equal to x squared plus 1. What that means is you're going to take your graph, y equals to x squared, and you're going to translate it upwards by one unit. So literally, you're moving the graph one unit up. Okay? So if q is 1, we move the graph one unit up, and this is going to be the graph y equals x squared plus 1. Okay, so just reinforcing, if Q is positive, the graph moves up by Q units. All right. Now, as you can imagine, similarly, if Q is less than naught, which means Q is negative, then your graph is going to move down by Q units. Because remember, where are all your negative Y values? They're all below the X axis. So therefore, your graph will move down by Q units. So once again, if we take the graph Y is equal to X squared, which is the one in green, and we then move that graph one unit downwards, we're going to have a graph that looks like this. Okay, so it's still turning on the Y axis, but it's moved one unit down. Okay. So let's just go over that quickly and make sure you follow that. If Q is positive, we are looking at a, at a vertical shift upwards. And if Q is negative, we are looking at a vertical shift downwards. All right, hope you're all with me. The next thing we're going to look at is what happens when we multiply the independent term or the independent variable by a factor A. So again, guys, we're looking at the graph y is equal to x squared plus q. And in this case, we're looking at what happens, just rem reminding you guys what happens when we multiply that x squared by an a. By an a. All right. So what happens? When you multiply by a, this will stretch or compress the graph vertically by the factor a. Now what that means, stretch or compress, it really depends on whether you're timesing by a fractional value of a or a non-fractional value or a value that's bigger than 1 or less than 0. Okay, so if we're talking about a fraction between 0 and 1, you're going to have a graph that is compressed. Okay, so let's look at an example. So we have the graph y is equal to x squared which is drawn in green, okay, that's y is equal to x squared. And if we look at the graph, y is equal to a half x squared, what have we done? We've taken this x squared and we've multiplied it by a half, so a is equal to a half. And because we've multiplied it by a fractional number that lies between 0 and 1, okay, our graph is actually compressed. So you can see, as I've drawn here for you, you can see that the graph moves in, it's squeezed in, okay, it's compressed. So if you multiply by a, and a is a fraction between 0 and 1, your graph is going to be compressed. On the other hand, if you multiply, say for example, by a less than 0, so we're multiplying by a negative value, which is less than 0, obviously, um, that's going to reflect the graph. Now remember, why would it reflect it? Okay, if you're thinking about your axes, Everything, all your y values above the x-axis are positive, right? You know that, going from north upwards, that's all positive. And then all of your y values below the x-axis are negative. So if I'm going to times my y equals x squared by a negative factor, obviously it's going to then reflect it in the x-axis, and because we're timesing by 2, all right, it's going to also stretch the graph. Okay, so the 2 is the thing that stretches the graph, and the minus is what reflects the graph. All right, so I hope you guys are all with me. Remember, we've just gone over the concepts that you learned in grade 10, which is what happens when you um, introduce a plus Q or if you times your function by A. All right, now in grade 11... There's a new concept that's introduced. You learned about vertical shifts, as I've shown you with the Q last year. 
in grade 11, we introduce something called a horizontal shift. So your graph is no longer going to sit on the y-axis, if we're talking strictly about parabolas now. Your graph is no longer going to just sit on the y-axis and turn on the y-axis and move around on the y-axis. With a horizontal shift, your graph is going to either move to the left or to the right of the y-axis. All right. In grade 11, the graphs that you look at have the form y is equal to a times x plus p squared plus q. Guys, can you see this is different? Different from the ones you learned last year because we now have the introduction of this x plus p. All right, and that's going to affect the horizontal movement of the graph that you learned last year. Okay, so what happens with this graph? Remember, dealing with parabolas. Okay, later on we will look at hyperbole. But now we're looking at the parabola. Okay, so we're looking at graphs of the form y is equal to a times x plus p squared plus q. And what you will also learn this year is that when you multiply this expression out, you get y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. And that is the defining equation of a parabola. So either in this form or in that form, defining equations of parabola. All right, so what happens here? If a, that's that a there, is greater than naught, which means positive, then we have a minimum turning point. Okay, and guys, you'll remember this from last year. It's the same concept. You have a smiley face. Okay, I always remember it like this. You have minimum problems, therefore you are happy. Okay, so with a parabola where your a is positive, you have a minimum turning point. Okay, if a is less than naught, so a is negative, then you're going to have a sad face or a frown and you then have a maximum turning point. All right, so A is positive, minimum turning point. A is negative, maximum turning point. Now, if we're dealing with Q again, if Q is positive, then your turning point will be above the x-axis. Makes sense, that's where all your positive y values are. If Q is less than naught, so Q is negative, then your turning point will lie below the x-axis. All right, then this is the new concept that you learn in grade 11. The addition of that x plus p into your equation. All right, what does that do? This x plus p, the p affects the horizontal shift of the graph. Okay, it also affects the axis of symmetry. Now remember your axis of symmetry divides your graph into two mirror pieces. They're exactly the same if you fold it over. So it affects the axis of symmetry and it affects the horizontal shift. If P is positive, so we're talking about this number inside the bracket, if it's positive, then your turning point is going to be on the left of the y-axis. Now, intuitively, it doesn't make sense because if it's positive, we're dealing with positive numbers, it should be on this side. No. When you're dealing with a horizontal shift, the opposite thing happens. If P is positive, then your turning point will be on the left, so either there or there. And if P is negative, again, the opposite thing happens. Your turning point is going to be on the right, so either there or there. Okay. Also, your axis of symmetry is the line X is equal to negative P, so that comes straight from um, the defining equation. X is equal to negative P is your axis of symmetry. The negative sign, very, very important because it determines whether you put your axis of symmetry on the left or the right-hand side. Okay. Guys, another thing I want to show you, just talking about axis of symmetries or axes of symmetries. X is equal to negative B over 2A is another way to find the axis of symmetry. I don't want to go into too much of detail with this, we will do this when we come across an example, but x is equal to negative b over 2a is another way
to find the axis of symmetry. Especially important if your graph is not given to you in the form where the square is completed. Because when we've written it in this form, y is equal to a times x plus p squared plus q, you've actually completed the square to get it in that form. But if you're just given your graph in its normal format, as y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, then it is easier to use x is equal to minus b over 2a to find the axis of symmetry. I do quickly want to look at an example, and I know that I am uh, doing quite a lot in the beginning session here, Abraham, so I know it's probably time for a break, but I want to go over this question really, really quickly. Okay, so can we, can we carry on? Yes. All right, great. Okay, so guys, we're going to sort of put all of this into context by looking at an example. Okay, remember this is the new type of parabola that you're seeing for the first time in grade 11. So if we are asked to sketch y is equal to 2 times x minus 3 squared minus 8, what do we do? Okay, the first thing you guys need to remember is that this determines the shape of your graph, the value of a. If a is positive, remember I showed you in the beginning, you're going to have a happy face. That's going to be the shape of your graph. In other words, you're going to have a minimum turning point. That's the first thing that you need to decide. So you sort of have in your head, okay, that's the picture I'm going for. All right. Another thing I need to mention is your turning point. When you have a parabola in the form a times x plus p squared plus or minus q, your turning point is given by the coordinates minus p and q. All right, so if you've got your defining equation, minus p is the x value of your turning point, and q is the y value of your turning point. Okay, just keep that in mind. All right? The axis of symmetry, a over s, that means the axis of symmetry. Remember I told you the axis of symmetry is x is equal to negative p. So here, if p is negative 3, then x is going to be equal to negative 1 times negative 3, which will give me positive 3. So therefore, my axis of symmetry is x is equal to 3. Your turning point, so slightly different from the way you did it last year. It's not going to turn on the y-intercept anymore. Your turning point is given straight from your formula. You literally read it out from the equation they give you. So we've got 2 times x minus 3 squared minus 8. Remember I told you your turning point is minus p. So minus times a minus 3 is going to be positive 3. So it's minus p and q. So it's going to be positive 3 and negative 8. All right, y-intercept. Remember, remember to find the y-intercept, we say let x equal 0. In this equation, if you let x be 0, you're going to get 3 squared, which is 9. 9 times 2 is 18. 18 minus 8 is 10. So your y-intercept is 0 and 10. Then, x-intercepts. Remember, for x-intercepts, you say, let y be 0. Okay, so once again, you take your defining, your, I keep saying defining when I mean you're given. You take your given equation, you let y be equal to 0, and you solve for x. I'm not going to go through that in detail, because that's just a quadratic equation, which all of you guys know how to do by now. So you let that be equal to naught, and you solve for x, and you'll get x-intercepts of 1 and 0, and 5 and 0. The domain and range I'll come back to now. All right, so let's draw the graph from all the information we've got so far. Okay, and I'm going to just try and squeeze it in here. Okay, so we have our axis, right? Let's mark down our key points. We know, okay, so we know that x is equal to 3 is the axis of symmetry. We know the turning point is 3 and minus 8. So x is equal to 3 and y is equal to minus 8. So that's somewhere there. I'm obviously making a very rough sketch, so um, my scale is not going to be correct. So x is 3, y is minus 8. Your turning point is um, 3 and minus 8. Your y-intercept is 0 and 10. So on the y-axis, we plot x is 0 and y is 10. And then your x-intercepts 
are 1 and 0. So on my axis, I'm going to put x is 1, and then the other one was 5, right? And then we join all of those points together. And that gives us our parabola. So guys, as you can see, different from last year, not sitting on the y-axis, turning at 3 and negative 8. Okay, so important. The new concept there, your turning point is minus P and Q. Now let's have a look at the domain. Remember, your domain is your set of X values. In this case, X is an element of reals. If you look at your graph, you can see why there's no restriction on your X values. Okay, it can go on forever negatively, it can go on forever positively. So X is an element of real numbers. Now if you look at your range, remember your range is your set of Y values. If you look at the graph, you can see that it only starts from that point, and then it's everything above that point. So your graph is everything above that value. All of your y values lie above that value. And we know that that bottommost value, that minimum value, is minus 8. So therefore, we have y is an element from minus 8 to infinity. There's no restriction on the positive y's, but we only start from negative 8. Okay, so your range will be y is an element, from negative infinity, from, sorry, from negative 8 to positive infinity, we include the negative 8 and obviously we exclude infinity. So this is interval notation. You can write it like that. In fact, you should all know how to write it that way. Otherwise, you can say y is greater than or equal to negative 8. Okay. All right. So that was just a very quick um, example to show you how we're going to use this new turning point concept, but we'll do another example later on. And I'm sure it's time to go to a break. Abba. Indeed, Natasha. Thank you very much on that one. Mindset is go get some waters and just relax a bit, but we're coming for more surprises also coming later on the show. I told you that we're going to be having some giveaway today, book giveaways. So do stay tuned. See you after the break. Welcome back, Mindset is Great Level Mathematics Functions, a show that is proudly sponsored by Macmillan. I hope you're enjoying it and the energy is all pumped up. I can see on the page, the guys are on the page. Natasha, you're doing a great job. The guys are listening and they're learning a lot. Some are away from the holiday and some have just came back. Guys, there's no more time now for all the vacation. It's time to work. As Natasha said, said earlier on that, it's time to get your brains working again. But for now, let me give you some few details as Natasha is, is about to get more on the lesson. Be on the page with me. It's facebook.com forward slash LearnExtra on Twitter. Tweet with me at LearnExtra and download your notes on learnextra.co.za forward slash live. Natasha, let's get more. All right, great. Thanks, Abram. Okay, so guys, as I said, I know today it's information overload. There's a lot of work to cover, a lot of theory, and uh, I hope that you are all following, and if there are any questions, please let us know, and I'll try and help you out. Okay, now the next graph we're going to move to is the one of the hyperbole, and for some reason, people don't like this one. I don't know why, but anyway. So the defining equation also, again, slightly different from what you learned last year because there's this introduction of the horizontal shift. Now, let me remind you, if you just tuned in and you missed the section on parabolas, if you have a positive p-value, you're going to have a horizontal shift to the left, okay? If you have a negative p-value, you're going to have a horizontal shift to the right. Okay, but we'll go over it with an example so that you guys can um, sort of get your heads around it. Okay, a few things we need to remind you of. Okay, your defining equation that you learned last year, y is equal to a over x plus q. That was your defining equation of the hyperbola. As you can see, the thing that's different is now instead of just an x in the denominator, we have x plus p. Okay, so that's going to, as I said, it's going to change the graph horizontally. Okay, something you need to remember, in an increasing function, right, when the graph is increasing, what it means is that as the x values increase, the y values increase at the same time. So an example of that would be a graph that looks like that, 
Okay, we can see it's always increasing. The y values will always increase as the x values increase. All right? In a decreasing function, as the x values increase, as you would guess, right, what would happen? If the x values are increasing, but the graph is a decreasing function, that means that the y values will decrease. Okay, an example of that is something that looks like that. All right, so as the x values are increasing, the y values keep getting smaller. Okay, this is important, especially when we deal with hyperbole and then next week when we look at the exponential function. All right, now with a hyperbola, if A is greater than naught, then the hyperbola is a decreasing function. Now, why is that? Remember from last year, you learned that when you deal with hyperbole, there's two kind of uh, shapes. Now, people think of it as separate graphs, but they're not separate graphs. It's the same graph. It's one graph. When you were dealing with A greater than naught, do you remember that those graphs would be in quadrant one and in quadrant three and the reason for that if a is positive we know here that means you're timesing positive x values by positive y values a positive times a positive will give us a positive so a is greater than naught all right in the third in the third quadrant x is negative y is negative and if we take a negative and times it by a negative we get a positive. So once again, A is greater than naught. Okay, so that's from last year. So if A is greater than naught, the hyperbola is a decreasing function because guys, look at what happens, right? If we look at any point here, right? So say I'm at that point. So that's X1. And then here we have some Y1, all right? And if I move further along to the right of this graph, so look at that point there. So that's x2, and this across is going to be y2. What can you see? The x1 to x2, we're increasing. x2 is obviously greater than x1, so therefore we're increasing in x values. But what's happening to the y values? they decreasing. We go from y1 to y2. So as the x values are increasing, the y values are Decreasing, that's what we mean by a decreasing function, all right? Similarly, if A is less than naught, then the hyperbola is an increasing function because once again from last year, you'll remember, if A is negative, we have a, a graph which we draw in the second quadrant and fourth quadrant, okay? Because here, Y values are positive, X values are negative, positive times a negative is negative. And here in the fourth quadrant, X values are positive, Y values are negative, positive times negative is negative. So again, we get A is less than naught. Okay, so that's your standard functions from last year. And so when A is less than naught, the hyperbola is an increasing function. Once again, you can have a look at that graph as the X values increase your y values also increase. All right. Now, the value of q, just like with the parabola, the value of q determines the vertical shift of the graph. Okay? And importantly, it also gives you the horizontal asymptote. So y is equal to q is a horizontal asymptote. Guys, do you remember what an asymptote is? Hopefully, you're all shouting out, but an asymptote is a line or a graph or whatever you want to call it, but the actual function that you're working with is undefined along that line. Okay, so if y was equal to 2 and we're looking at a hyperbola, then this hyperbola would not intersect that line y is equal to 2 because the graph would be undefined at its asymptote. Okay, so asymptote means the function you are dealing with, your hyperbole, is undefined at the asymptote. That's what we mean. Okay, it's undefined. So the graph has no possible um, x or y solutions along the asymptote. Okay? So that's q. q determines the vertical shift and it gives you the horizontal asymptote. p, which is now in your denominator, remember, of your new defining equation for hyperbole. So we're talking about that p there. That's going to give you the horizontal shift of the graph. So it's going to mean it's going to move either to the left or it's going to move to the right. 
All right? And it gives the position of the vertical asymptote. So the position of the vertical asymptote is x is equal to negative p. And this should make sense to you because if you look at this, if I have a over, and if x is negative p, negative p plus p is 0. Okay, and we know that anything divided by naught is undefined. So therefore, it makes sense to have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to negative p. All right? The axis of symmetry, remember these uh, provide you a mirror image of the graphs. The axis of symmetry are y is equal to x plus p plus q, and y is equal to negative x plus p plus q. But again, this will all make more sense as we look at an example, and I've noticed that I'm getting really, really untidy here, so I'm going to try and get some of this stuff off. All right. So we'll look at axis of symmetry and all the rest when we do this example. Okay, guys, and I know that, you know, for some of you, it might seem like, what is this? What are we going on about? I know that you haven't gone back to school yet, and some of you might not have done this section yet, but hopefully it will give you a basis and a foundation so that when you go to school and you start learning about this horizontal shift, you'll remember what you'd learned on mindset. Okay? All right. Okay, so the example we're going to look at where we've got to draw y is equal to negative 12 over x plus 4 minus 2. Okay? First thing we do, we notice A is negative. So that means we're going to have a graph that lies in the second and fourth quadrants. All right. So that means A is negative. We're dealing with what kind of function? Increasing or decreasing? Hopefully you all said increasing here. Okay? All right, so we're dealing with an increasing function, and therefore we've got a graph in the second and the fourth quadrants. First thing we do, calculate the y-intercept. How do you calculate the y-intercept? We say let x equal to naught. So in our equation, we substitute x is equal to naught, and we get minus 12 over positive 4 minus 2, which gives us negative 5. So therefore, our y-intercept is 0, and negative 5. Okay, next thing. Calculate the x-intercept. How do we calculate the x-intercept? We say let y equal to 0. So if y is equal to 0, we now need to solve this fractional equation. How do you solve fractional equations? We multiply through by the denominator. So we times through by x plus 4, and we get minus 12 times minus 2 times x plus 4, times the minus 2 into your brackets, and you get minus 2x minus 8. Add your like terms, take your x over to the left-hand side, and we get 2x is equal to negative 20. So therefore, dividing both sides by 2, we get x is equal to negative 10. Okay, so your x-intercept is negative 10 and 0. Okay. So what did we do? We looked at the shape of the graph. We figured out, okay, it is an increasing function. We then found the y-intercept by letting x be naught, and then we worked out the x-intercept by letting y be naught. Okay, all right. So that's what we've got here. Just summarized for you. A is negative, so we've got an increasing function. Asymptotes, very important, guys. Remember what we said? Y is equal to Q is your horizontal asymptote. So in this case, the value of q was negative 2. So therefore, y is equal to negative 2 is our horizontal asymptote. Then our vertical asymptote we got from x is equal to negative p. p was 4. So therefore, x is equal to negative 4 is the vertical asymptote. So this is our vertical asymptote, and the other one is our horizontal asymptote. We've worked out y-intercept, we've worked out x-intercept. Now to work out our axis of symmetry, remember what we said, y is equal to x plus p plus q is one of the axes of symmetry, and the other one is y is equal to negative x negative p plus q. All right, so just straight from your equation, I took this straight from your equation, I've got y is equal to x plus p minus q, and we get y is equal to x plus 2 is one axis of symmetry, 
And similarly, y is equal to negative x, negative 6 is another axis of symmetry. Domain and range, I'll go over just now. Okay. Now, guys, what I've done is because we've got so much to cover, I've actually put all the key points down on a graph, and I'm just going to go through them with you. Okay. First thing we know, let's, let's mark down our axes of symmetry. Y is equal to... Okay, let's do the asymptotes. Y is equal to negative 2. So this point here is negative 2. Y is equal to negative 2 was our horizontal asymptote. So we have that marked down. X is equal to negative 4. So that's this pink line going down here. That was our vertical asymptote. Okay, so I'm going to put all the axes and asymptotes and all of that down. All right. So x is equal to negative 4, y is equal to negative 2, our two asymptotes, right? Let's look at our axes of symmetry. Remember we had y is equal to x plus 2. Now this is a straight line. You did straight lines last year and you also did them in grade 9. y is equal to x plus 2. I can plot this using the dual intercept method. If I say let x be naught, I get y is equal to 2 is the y uh, intercept. And if we say let y be naught, we get x is equal to negative 2 as the x intercept. So that's just your straight line that you all should be familiar with by now. And then the other one was y is equal to negative x, negative 6. That was the other axis of symmetry. So we've got our axes of symmetry. We've got our vertical and horizontal asymptotes. And so we draw the graph. So you can see I've already drawn the graph between the two asymptotes. Remember, the asymptote means your graph cannot touch those lines. So those pink lines, as you can see, the green graphs, we've got our increasing function. It's not touching. It goes parallel to those asymptotes, never touching. Okay, and you can see that at the bottom as well. Parallel to the asymptote, never touching the asymptote. All right. Okay, guys, so we've gone over that in quite um, quick, I think, quite quick succession, the par parabola and the hyperbole. I hope that you are all following us, but remember you are going to do this at school if you haven't already, and uh, this just really will form the foundation, the basis for you to get better at this section. Um, when we come back, I'll try and do a quick recap and then we'll look at the kind of question you can expect in an exam situation. Thank you very much, Natasha. And as promised to you, mindsetters, we're having eight books that we're giving away this week. We'll be giving away two today. Uh, just now and two more tomorrow and the last four we're going to be giving it away on Wednesday so do stay tuned if you didn't make it today you are going to make it trust me but now let me just give away with the books that we have I have a list of your emails because we said to you mindsetters you should email us your email addresses in order for you to enter for a competition so I have the names of the people that entered for the competition and I have the books that we're giving away remember we had a bucket of uh, a bucket list of 100 books that you should read before you graduate slash die but now let me just take it away and just I'm just going to make it fair, you know, Natasha. <laughs> it should, should be fair. Should I be like an adjudicator? <laughs> yeah, you should. Trust me. Okay, so I close your eye. I will block your eyes. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, let me do this. I have one now. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Drum roll. Da -da -da. Right, and the <laughs> first winner, it's Sinead from Sunwood Park High School. Sinead. Yeah, yeah Sinead. 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 Uh -huh. Welcome to you, Sinead. Uh, uh, congratulations, Amen. And let's, let's grab another winner. Right. Let's shake, shake. <laughs> Let it be fair. Okay. Let's see. Could be you. All right. And our second winner, it is Lo Lononyane Felicia from Pachamang Secondary School. Well done, guys. And let me see now who's getting which book. Mm -hmm. Can we just quickly do oh, this? Another one. Yeah. Sure. Uh, for Sinead, let's see which book are you getting. Just going to grab one. Okay. Sinead, we'll be giving you Monsters of Man. Fantastic. For you, Sinead. Mm -hmm. And let's see for Lenonyane. Mm -hmm. uh, Lenonyane, we're giving you um, Raven's Gate. Raven's Gate, it's a nice book, trust me. So I'll be showing you in the books right after the break. Congratulations to the guys that have entered for the competition and won. Those who didn't make it, tomorrow there's another draw. So do stay tuned uh, on your Learn Extra. See you after the break.
Welcome back, Mindsetters. And as promised to you, we don't just promise, we deliver. Sinead, you'll be getting this book, Monsters of Man, with a dictionary, proudly sponsored by Macmillan. So we're not just teaching you mathematics, as Natasha said mm -hmm. earlier on. We're also teaching you English. And for you, Lenonyan, you'll be getting this book, Ravensgate, and also a dictionary. I hope you're going to enjoy it. And Mindsetters, stay on the look, because tomorrow it might be you. So the draw is coming away uh, tomorrow. So Natasha, take it away with mathematics. Now. All right, good. Well done to uh, you guys who won those books. Fantastic prize. Okay, guys, so I'm going to try and just rush through this really, really quickly, um, but hopefully in depth and hopefully you guys really understand what I'm doing. Um, this is an exam type question and it comes straight from your Macmillan textbook. And we're going to look at um, answering a typical exam question all about parabolas and straight lines, okay? So this is from the Keeping Math Simple, Grade 11 Learner's Book, page 175. And this is exercise 5.21, number 3. Okay, so that's where this comes from if you would like to go over this yourself. Okay, so it says, the equations of the graphs shown in the sketch are, and it gives you your parabola, and then it gives you the equation f of your straight line. Okay, hopefully you guys can see this diagram nice and clearly on your side. Okay, so we've got g is your parabola, and then we've got f as your straight line. First question it says, give the coordinates of d the y-intercept of both graphs. Now guys, some of you who are quite good at maths and, you know, you find all of this stuff really easy, you can see straight away that your y-intercept of your parabola is minus 24 and the, uh, the y-intercept of the straight line is also negative 24. Okay, but we're going to go through it just in case there's someone at home who doesn't understand how do we get there. Okay, you can see that at the point D, they both have the same y-intercept. How do we find a y-intercept? To find the y-intercept, we say let x equal to 0. So I'm going to take the simpler one, all right? We've got f of x is equal to 3x minus 24. I'm going to use that one. You can see that they both have the same y-intercept, so we could use either one. So if I say let x equal to 0, basically what it means is wherever there's an x, I substitute a 0. So I'm going to get 3 times 0 minus 24. So therefore we get 0 minus 24 is negative 24. So my y-intercept is negative 24. Remember, we want this as a coordinate. So therefore d will be the point x is 0 y is negative 24. Okay, so that's the first part. Nice and easy. Next part. We are then asked to calculate the coordinates of A and B, the x-intercepts of G. So if we go back up here, there we go. A, there's B, the x-intercepts of the parabola. Okay, so let's see if I can remember that equation in my head. We've got G of x is equal to I think it was negative x squared plus 10x minus 24, but let's just go back and double check. So it's negative x squared plus 10x negative 24. Fantastic. All right, how do we find x-intercepts? We say let y equal to 0. Now remember your function value g of x, that represents your y values. So therefore, if I say let y equal to 0, I'm going to get minus x squared plus 10x ne minus 24 is equal to 0. And then to make things simpler, I'll divide through by the negative. So I get x squared minus 10x plus 24 is equal to 0. We now have a quadratic equation, which we can factorize into two brackets. So we get x minus 6 times x minus 4 is equal to 0. So therefore, straight from there, we let each bracket equal to 0, and I get x is equal to 6, or x is equal to 4. Guys, I wanted you to find the coordinates of A and B. So a lot of times people leave it at that point, 
which technically, I mean, the answer is right, but you haven't completely answered the question. A is the point. Okay, if you go back up to your graph. Okay, have a look. A is the first x value. B is the second x value of your x-intercept. So therefore, obviously, A is smaller than B. So therefore, A is going to be the point 4, 0. And B is going to be the point 6, 0. Okay. All right. The next part. So far, easy stuff. Finding x-intercepts and y-intercepts. The next one says, determine the coordinates of C, the turning point of G. So if you look at your graph, there we go. There's C sitting there. We want to know what is the coordinate of the turning point. Now, if you notice, your equation is given in the form AX squared plus BX plus C. In other words, it's not written in the form where the square has been completed. Because if the square is completed and you've got a parabola in that form, it's easy to just read off your coordinates of your turning points is minus p and q. But we don't have that. We've given, we are given the equation in standard form. We need to find the turning point. How do we do that? Okay, you'll remember early on in the lesson, I told you to find your axis of symmetry. We say x is equal to negative b over 2a. Okay. Then, if I want to find, so this is the x value of your turning point, if I want to find the y value, I substitute that x value, whatever the x value is, into the equation. Okay, and that will be the y coordinate of your turning point. All right, so how do we do it? We go to our equation. We've got my, and remember, please, 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 always take it from the original. Don't take it from the one that you've changed in your sum when you were trying to find x-intercepts. You need to deal with the original equation. y is equal to negative x squared plus 10x minus 24. Okay, if you start changing the signs in that, you're going to get the sign of your axis of symmetry incorrect. Okay, so b B, remember, is the term is the constant in front of the b of the x term. So b is going to be 10, and then a is going to be the number in front of your x squared term. So a is negative 1. Okay, so my axis of symmetry is x is equal to negative b, which is 10, all over 2 times a, which is negative 1. Okay, simplifying that, I've got minus 10 over minus 2, which is 5. Okay? We need to find the y value that corresponds to that axis of symmetry. So we need to find the y value of the turning point. So I substitute 5 into my equation. Sorry, that should have been a g. Okay, so I substitute that into my equation. So I go g of 5, and wherever there was an x, in the original uh, function that was given to me, I substitute 5. So I've got minus 5 squared. All right. And then it's going to be plus 10 times 5 and then minus 24. Okay, all of this you can put straight into your calculator. So we've got minus 25 plus 50 minus 24. Okay, so we should get an answer of 1. 50 minus 25 is 25. 25 minus 24 is 1. So therefore, my turning point, which was C, is going to have the coordinates x is 5 and y is 1. Okay, guys, so if I go to the graph and show you where we're at, okay, that point C there we go, that point there, is x is equal to 5 and y is equal to 1. Okay, so hopefully you're all with me up until this point. We've only got two parts of the question, uh, three parts, so I can't count. We've got three parts left to do, so let's get into it. Okay, so we found the coordinates of the turning point. Next we need to calculate the coordinates of E, which is one of the points of intersection of F and G. Intersection, remember that means where the two graphs meet, okay? 
So if we look at E, this is the point where the two graphs intersect. Another point of intersection would be D. Okay, they also intersect at the Y intercept. So how do we find E? Simple, if you're looking for points of intersection, you need to solve these two equations simultaneously. All right? So we're going to use simultaneous equations to find the point of intersection. And this is D. We had f of x is equal to 3x minus 24. And then we had g of x is equal to negative x squared plus 10x minus 24. All right. Let's just double check our equations. 3x minus 24. And we were dealing with negative x squared plus 10x minus 24. So here I've got, remember, f of x and g of x really represents y value. So it's like saying y is equal to 3x minus 24 and y is equal to, we want to see where these two values correspond. Okay. So I can call the straight line, let's call that equation 1. And then we can call the parabola, the defining equation, equation 2. Remember, with simultaneous equations, where we're using the method of substitution, I'm going to substitute equation 1 into equation 2 and solve simultaneously. So wherever there is a, a y, I'm going to put in 3x minus 24. So that means I'm going to get 3x minus 24 in place of this y, is equal to negative x squared plus 10x minus 24. All right? Okay, so we're going to take everything over to the left-hand side. We get x squared plus 10x. We bring it over. Plus 10 becomes a negative 10. Negative 10 plus 3 is negative 7x. And then we've got... Um, Minus 24, taking it over, it becomes positive 24, so they cancel off. All right, so we factorize x into x minus 7 is equal to naught. So therefore, x is equal to naught, or x is equal to 7. The coordinate x is equal to naught was the point of intersection at D. So x is equal to 7 will be the point E. All right? I've got the x value, I need the y value, so all I do is substitute into either of the equations. I'm going to use the straight line, but really you can use either one, you'll get the same answer. And we get 21 minus 24, which is negative 3. So E is the point, x is 7, and y is negative 3. Okay, so those are the coordinates of the points of intersection. Now, guys, if you look at the last two, and we're not going to have time to go over the last two questions, but there are nice questions that come up in every test and exam. For which values of x is g increasing, and for which values of x is g of x greater than naught? I'm going to leave those two for you to do as a challenge question. I want to see what you get an, as an answer. What I would like to do is to give you a quick hint for e. Remember that a graph is increasing, if as the x values increase, the y values increase at the same time. Okay, thank you so much. Back thank you, you very much, Natasha. We've really, really learned a lot. I was also jotting down my own notes. Hope you're doing the same right there at home. But thank you to all the mindsetters that have been on the page, participating, helping one another also on the page. And would like to say a big thank you to our sponsor of the show, Macmillan. And congratulations to our winners of the day for winning two wonderful books that they should read before they graduate or matriculate. But otherwise, thank you very much from me and Natasha. We'll see you some other time. Have a blessed evening. Bye.